You are now listening to the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, the Going North Podcast. I'm your host, certified self-leadership trainer and author of the best-selling book, Stay the Course, Dom Reitman. And you're going to be getting some goodies today from the guest that's up next. And today on the Highlight Reel Builder for Authors, known as GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, it's the Going North Podcast, because we got one heck of a super special, awesome human for you today. It's one of those host-to-host specials, y'all. I'm telling you, it's like a mic takeover, where instead of today's guest being the one asking the questions, it's usually in reverse, because today's guest in particular, part of the wonderful M2M crew, Mayhem to Miracles. She's a wellness expert, personal and executive coach, international speaker, and syndicated radio host that brings over 30 years of wellness experience. So that's right, folks. She's been doing it since she came out the womb, y'all. All Things Wellness, a revolutionary approach created by this wonderful lady right here, Miss P.W., Miss C.P.W. So let's give it up for the champ herself, Miss Powerful and Wonderful, Coach Peggy Wilms. How you doing today, Coach Peggy? Oh, boy, that's worth a couple of that. You're getting a check in the mail. What an intro. I, I owe you for that. I'm so happy to be here. So excited. You're right. Most of the time I'm sitting on the side over there with you and. Well, as you know, with all introductions, they're not allowed to be 33 and a half days long. So mind filling in any cavities I may have missed about you? No, I don't think so. It was, that was great. I coach. Um, of course, I'm in coaching and training and nutrition and all that fun stuff. I spent about 25 years in corporate and wellness. So I certainly understand how corporate America goes or doesn't go. And uh, so I really understand behavior. I've been working with behavior for about three decades and um, helping other people try to find the best quality of life they can Dom you know so I don't think you left anything out it's good times it's not easy being me Dom somebody's got to do it were you jamming are you dancing what are you doing oh don't worry it's just usually me when the guests talk I just jam in their zone it's like yeah like just tuning in to the wonderful pig and all of her wonderful energy oh you're sweet yeah <laughs> and she's the queen of one-liners because my goodness you could probably write a book alone off all, all the one-liners you have <laughs> i'm here to tell you there are a lot of them and i'm the acronym queen anything that i can put into an acronym i don't know if it's because it's easy for me to remember or I pretend it's easy for everybody else to remember but yeah i have a ton of mantras some of them you can't say on air in australia but <laughs> you know hey every other every other continent's fine so but yeah I've got, I've got a few up my sleeve. I won't pull any on you. T- like even M2M, right? Mayhem to Miracle. That's that's kind of an acronym for us. So. That's right. That's right. And so my goodness, corporate wellness. So what inspired you to really get into that field of all the fields to get into? Like maybe, maybe right. do you think one day you might have been an astronaut as a little version of Peg maybe? No, who's going to put, who's going to put me in a capsule and send me off into the universe and think I'm going to stay there? No, I'm not going to be an astronaut. Jeez, that would be horrific. No, I actually, I was always active growing up. I was involved in sports and always trying to help others. So it was just a natural progression for me to go into personal training. I did that really young. Actually, it was right after I had my first son where I really started getting my certifications. And I was living in Germany. We were, I was working for the military and it just started over there in 89. And I just started competing and working in um, Miss Fitness and bodybuilding in the early 90s. And that's kind of how my story takes place is, you know, when I was first asked to be a contributing author for this book, I thought, how can I, I thought first to come at it as a coaching angle. And then I really sat in it for a couple of weeks before I decided to even do it because I was like, you know, what do I have to contribute? Because I keep thinking about helping other people. And so I, I really sat in it and I said, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to take an authentic spin and be tr- more transparent myself. And so when I thought about what story I was going to share, it kept, this one kept coming up, this medical story with my um, second son. And, and so I just kind of went for it. But 
what caught me by surprise is how much I really buried it and made it kind of not a big deal. And as I bubbled up, I thought, you know, that really was amazing. And it was really typical of my character to kind of just, you have a situation, here's the data, you deal with it, you look at the pros and cons, you make a decision and you plow through. And that's how I've dealt with things my whole life. So when I peeled this back, you know, 27 years to share this story in this book, I was really surprised at it that I made it through it and made the decisions I did because it was not easy back then having a medical diagnosis that uh, not everybody, it was embarrassing. You know, I was diagnosed. Do you want me to share my story, Dom, or you want? Sure, go on ahead. Yeah, so we I had gone, I had my first son and uh, we had gone camping and I came back home just real casual, opened up the mail and I happened to have a letter in there from the local blood bank that pretty much, you know, in today's world would be shocking. You wouldn't re receive the results that I did via mail. You'd get a phone call, come on in, let's chat. But I got a letter pretty much saying that, you know, you can no longer donate for our blood bank. You have, you know, we've detected hepatitis C in your blood, which in 1993, the real... Pamela Anderson was really the only name that you could, you know, coincide with hepatitis C. It was kind of a little bit fresh. What is it? Um, immediately, though, I associated it with this isn't good. You know, like I immediately said, okay, this is going to have some connotations. You know, I was married, has never been a drug user, was not an alcoholic, did not, hadn't had a blood transfusion, any of the markers that you look at with how did you get hepatitis C. I didn't hit any of it. When I got that letter, obviously I went into my physician. It was about a week later before I got in and I was bodybuilding. So I was real thin and the doctor said, you know, when's the last time that you had your, your womanly menstruation, Dom? And I said, not at all, because when you're bodybuilding, you're lean. And so I didn't think anything of it. He said, well, we need to run a pregnancy test. And I kind of laughed at him I'm like, geez, if I'm pregnant, like somebody's gonna die. I'm not pregnant. <coughs> well, it, seriously. But they ran it twice and I was. So in that same exact visit that I was going to talk about this blood disorder, I find out I was pregnant with my son. And everything went crazy after that. It was really um, every specialist I saw, every family member I talked to, every friend I had a discussion was like, what, what are you doing? You can't carry this child. I mean, your life is at risk. We don't know if you'll live. We'll don't, you know, and it was, it was tough. So I just went massively internally and had to kind of go with, you know, my intuition and it didn't, I, abortion wasn't, a, just wasn't an option. I didn't know if something was going to happen, it was going to happen, but I wasn't certainly going to sign the bottom line. But as I did say in the book, peer pressure was a big deal. And I did go to an abortion clinic and I did go into the facility and I did fill out the paperwork and go back and start to watch the movie. And I physically got sick. I left there. I vomited. I went home and said, whatever happens, happens. I'm, I die in birth. I die in birth. Fast forward, normal pregnancy felt like a million dollars. They continue to test me, test my liver because that's what it affects. Hepatitis, obviously. Liver's fine. Liver's fine. Everything was great. Tanner was born. My son was born healthy. I couldn't nurse him, of course, because I had hepatitis C. And um, he proceeds to get sick, extremely sick, about six days later. And long story short, he ends up with group B spinal meningitis and ends up in the hospital off and on for 21 days. So not only do I have this child that I didn't choose to abort, now he's sick. And I'm praying to God, now are you going to take him from me? Like I kept, I kept him and now what? And he survived that, just a fighter, just survived that thing. And we went on to live our life. Every six months I was tested, my liver was tested and it was fine. And every six, I had four, over 40 tests over 10 years in 2003, which was literally to the month, 10 years later, um, they tested my antibodies because I had an autoimmune disorder and they were kind of checking my blood and they were like, let's just check your antibodies and see what the hepatitis C markers are. Well, I didn't have any, I had none. And so that's where my story kind of starts and ends really is the fact that I was actually mis misdiagnosed with hepatitis C in 1993, chose to keep my son and 10 years later find out that I never had it. 
here we are today. He's 27 years old. He just had his first son, my first grandson. And yeah, so that's my mayhem to miracles contribution. And a powerful contribution indeed, because it was one of the first ones actually read out the book since I kind of flipped through and went sprinkle style and just picked a bunch of stories, especially ones that were coming up on the show indeed. And it was good that you decided to follow through with your miracle experience that didn't seem like a miracle at the time. You know, the hardest thing was, is, you know, in today's world, you pick up Google and you're going to do some research and you're going to, you know, figure out enough data to be able to rest and, and you know with hepatitis I didn't even have anybody to, to chat with I didn't even have any ex-drug users I knew to explain to me what it was I mean I didn't have anything and it was such a big deal with um, you know they didn't have anybody that said okay I'm 50 years old and I lived through it and here you go I mean today you can swallow a pill I mean there's so many people that have it it's it's really prevalent today but you look at that almost 30 years ago and we just simply didn't know. When I look back at it, because in 2003, when I was misdiagnosed and I got that diagnosis, I actually had a case manager at a health plan where I was working, look at all my medical charts over the 10 years and an attorney look at it. And they said, you know, this, this is the big lawsuit, but it's going to be about five years because there's a, there were five physicians over that 10 years who had managed my care and never retested the antibody. They kept testing my liver, but those are two different blood tests. And they said, there's five physicians going to fight for about five years, probably get $5 million out of it. And I went home and I, I, I still have downstairs the big, big Tupperware bins of all my paperwork, everything. And I went home and I said, you know what? I'm, I'm not living through this again. I already went through everything. Human beings, the blood bank, it, human beings did the best they could to take care of me. Nobody did any malice. You know, it all turned out divine. I'm not going to go through this crap where it was already, it was already tough enough. And so I really walked away from it. And then when this book came out and I just kind of wanted to tell one of my own personal stories, I've never shared, you know, this story with anyone and um, on this level. And I just thought it would be important for people like us who have radio shows or whatever we do. It's really important, I think, to turn the, you know, the, the light inward and be able to to share our own stuff, so. And it's a good deal indeed, because my goodness, because that story can probably inspire countless human beings, because it's a wonderful contribution to the dozens and dozens of stories with the trifecta so far, which soon will probably be almost like chicken soup for the soul in the few years coming with all the wonderful stuff that Ariel and Kat do with these sacred stories. So my goodness, being able to have the courage to share the story in particular and go deep in addition to the courage that you gain probably from sharing is there anything else you feel like you may have gained from really just buckling down and diving deep and sharing this to, out really with the world yeah i'm anxious to see you know the connections that you see now that the book is out now that the authors are all sharing and we're all you know you've got that connection that collaboration of just you know sharing stories with your peers and and i know for me right now, currently, since this book has come out, is the relationship with my son, Tanner, um, that I've just written a children's book that's going to come out just before Christmas that is actually about Tanner. And I wrote it 20 years ago. And it's really funny because I have, have it on my desk and I wrote it and laminated it and he was seven years old. And so it's going to come out and Tanner tells tales and there's all sorts of, this one's called Tanner, you know, he broke his nose. But um, he and I are actually talking about collaborating on a really long series where we talk about integrity and values and not fibbing and lying and how it turns into things over years and years and how you can trust your parents and find good mentors. So that came from this event, you know, this adventure that I went on with sharing his and my story together as now it's going to turn into children's, you know, his and my work to turn into children's books to share story. And we wouldn't have been able to do that. You know, I, when I was thinking about talking to you tonight, I remembered well, how I forgot to this and didn't share it in the book, but back when I was pregnant with him and everybody was talking about, you know, you need to have an abortion. There was a gal who was pregnant. I think it was 2020 or something I'd watched that night. There was a gal who was pregnant with conjoined twins and she had made a decision. She was on, it was 2020 or whatever, Dateline or I can't even remember, but she made a decision. She knew they were conjoined. 
she had the ultrasound and she still decided to have them. And I believe they lived until they were like 13 or 14 years old. But obviously at that time, I said to myself, I was laying on the couch and I remember thinking, if that girl, that woman can do it. And she has way more information than I do. I mean, I look like I have a healthy baby in here and everything seems fine. And she knows the struggles that she's up against. That's it. I, I mean, I'm all in. There's no question in my mind that I'm going to do this. So I think with anybody who's listening out there that the, the struggles that we can have, you may think that they're going to look a certain way and they don't look that way at all. It's, you know, for me, it did feel like I was fighting by my, you know, with myself and there was nobody on my team for a long time. It did really feel like this was a gamble. Mine lasted nine months. I, then I knew that I had a healthy boy and then it lasted 10 years before I got a diagnosis. And for you guys out there who have questions about whether your diagnosis is accurate or whether a test was accurate, second guess it, third guess it. Your intuition is like major money. And second guess that and, you know, keep pushing through because medical world isn't always right. That's right. You can say that again. Definitely can say that again. Indeed. My goodness, the peg and tan and betches, babe. That's right. That'll be scary. I told him, <laughs> I said, you be careful how many stories you tell me because these books could be, I mean, we could be writing them like for the next, you know, 20 years. There's something that mama just doesn't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be telling me too many of these secrets we have to turn into books, but I just think it will be so amazing for my grandson to see these children's books, because as a coach, I've spent three decades peeling back the onions and, you know, saying to people, oh, let's talk about these habits we want to rewire because, you know, we want to get healthy, wealthy, and wise, and I want to be more proactive. I want to teach our children how to develop, you know, these habits and how to become, um, you know, self-love, self-care, nutrition is food is fuel. Start there. Why aren't we teaching our kids about nutrition anymore? Physicians aren't even having nutrition classes anymore. They don't have physical education anymore. They don't have self-love classes, love languages. I mean, come on, man. They have to go find coaches when they're 50 years old and I have to smack them with my little wrist thing here <laughs> to rewire some habits. So that's where I'm gonna spend my energy is wiring these kiddos instead of rewiring adults, Dom. I quit. I resign, Dom. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm turning in my resignation. <laughs> <laughs> Went from Coach Peggy to Judge Peggy, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, I have my gavel over here. This, I mean, when I make decisions with clients, I'm like, case closed. And I just <clears throat> smack that thing over there. So there you go. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, looking forward to these books, indeed, because kids are definitely going to need them nowadays with all the information out there and really with all the different types of adversities they're going to face because technology has amplified everything, especially with bullying and cyberbullying, because it's like bullying back in the day, beat the bully up, hey, you just stand up for yourself, you're good. You leave that school. Right. But now it's like it can follow you freaking home, if not forever now, since once it's on the Internet, it's basically there forever. That's right. I, I was approached today about somebody who wants to be a coach and, and she's younger. And I just said, you know, you're walking into an industry and especially like you just said with social media, we're walking into a world where everybody thinks they can be everything. I mean, I, I joke all the time where it's like we got co coaches for eyelashes now. It's like everybody's <laughs> coach. It's like, oh, you want nice eyelashes? I'll coach through the best way to do it. I'm like, I mean, I'm being facetious, but Jesus so I mean, come on, man. Everybody's a coach. And and it's kind of it that's one of the worst things against us with social media is that anybody can put on this catfish persona in a professional world, even and say, look, I've done this, 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 and this, create a website and you know, create all these stories, write a book, make a million dollars. So I, you know, I I think getting back to telling stories like we did in this book that are authentic and true stories and from the heart and struggles, mayhem, that's more important than holding up all these certifications and things that can be mimicked on the internet. Like, let's get real. Let's tell some of this. Let's cry. Let's scream. Let's punch things. Let's tell these real stories and share those. And COVID started that for us last year. For the first time all around the world, we had one subject that we all had in common. 
we can't seem to all have love is a single subject for crying out loud. So let's have COVID. But I really believe that we, we can speak one language and it really needs to be storytelling. That's where it's at. Yeah, you can say that again, definitely, because stories unite us. Nick, that's how knowledge was shared back in the day when we didn't have these fancy, wonderful computers and smartphones that are designed to keep us glued to them forever. Mm-hmm. So since you're a fabulous coach who's earned her stripes for three decades and counting, has there ever been a m- coaching moment or even maybe even a series of coaching sessions with a client that have really helped you to become even better as a coach yourself, so kind of like with the teaching, becoming a better teacher with the students that help them? Yeah, I, I love that question. For those of you listening, that's not rehearsed. Just so you know, he's so brilliant. He just made that up. Yes, Dom. The best scenario I can give you, I'm in it right now, and it is the biggest blessing of my career. And I'll tell you why. I'm coaching a mom and a dad and their two sons. One is 20, one is 24. And I've been working with them for a couple of years. The reason I say it's such a blessing is that, first of all, I'm in, in their home. I'm virtually, right? I've been coaching virtually for about eight years. I should have invested in Zoom. We wouldn't be talking right now. We'd be on my yacht, Don. That's where we'd be because I'd be rich. <laughs> I, I knew Zoom before they could spell Zoom. But, but the dad and the mom, you know, when you work with the kiddos, you can do all you want to teach them and help them and, and, and try to get them to eat healthier or move more or journal or whatever, but the mom and dad still control it. Mm-hmm. Well, in this situation, you know, I've got the husband and the wife, and if one's struggling with eating, then the other one's struggling. So it's uh, this massive family dynamic. And of course, I'm HIPAA compliant. So the, the privacy and the, you know, all of that is within each individual person. So that what I've been able to learn about just family dynamics and behaviors and how they can do manipulation and, and sabotage within each other allowed me to kind of get inside the home, which is way different than someone showing up in your office and you're coaching some person individually when you don't know what really happens at home. Like, I really know if the donuts go home, buddy, because your brother just ratted on me. There's a dozen in the pantry. No. <laughs> well, I would say, I mean, that was that's one of the more fun examples that I can give you that really showed me that life is where it's at home. It's not a cookie cutter book, it's not a diet, it's not a nutrition plan. You can, you know, it's not a boot camp where you go and learn it all and everything magic happens and you're then a healthy weight or you know, you're off medication. It's at home. How do you live? How do you shop? How do you work? How are your kids? And it was a long answer, but that's where the magic is. Well, amen to that. I love that story too. And I think I'm the first ever to coach an entire family all at freaking once. Like that is definitely a rarity. That is a crown yeah. jewel moment right there. <laughs> it really is. It really is. I meet with them all separately, but sometimes I'll, I'll do challenges with them. And, and one of them, they were driving each other crazy, the two brothers, but I didn't want to tell them they were driving each other crazy. Like it was real serious conversation. And like, you know, my brother, blah, blah, blah. And they're teenagers, right? They're having, they're going to Columbia. They were having, I mean, during COVID, you know, social, they weren't going out dating was really big issues and they were really struggling. I learned a lot about what teenage boys and young adult males were going through last year. And um, so they were struggling with each other. And so I told one, as soon as you see the other one do what's bugging you, I want you, you know, you need to drop down and do like, 10 push-ups or 10 jumping jacks, I can't, I, whatever I said, 10 push-ups. It's like, well, why do I have to do 10 push-ups if what he's doing is driving me crazy? I said, just do it. See you next week. Boom, close. Well, bye-bye, honey. Love you. And so he comes back and he's done like, you know, I don't know, 500 or something over the last week. He's like, why did you make, well, and then the other brother's calling me and saying, are you making him do something? Because all of a sudden when I say something, he's dropping down and doing push-ups. <laughs> so this is whole family dynamic thing going on which is hysterical but so it's fun stuff like that that I can do with them that they don't really catch on right away that it's a mind game but it's it's a lot of fun fun. it really in the bottom line uh that little habit that was bothering him isn't a big deal anymore when you think about it because doing 500 push-ups makes you really realize it's kind of stupid uh, right. So the P and Peggy stands for Puppet Master. I got you. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. Puppet Master. Ooh, that's 
No one's ever called me that. Because <laughs> we were told a story. manipulator before. <laughs> Master manipulator, but I've never been called a puppeteer. <laughs> no, I like it. It's like, yeah, I dance puppets are getting healthier by the moment. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Geppetto strings going on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Good stuff. <laughs> oh, man. So since this is one of those moments where you get to be on the opposite side of the microphone, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often? Oh, my goodness sakes. That is an amazing question. I, I almost deflected because I'm so good at that, right? I almost was like, well... <laughs> <laughs> I swear, I'm like spitting in my mic. That was. Like, um, <laughs> I was waiting for it too. Like I'm gonna deflect this. One I was too. like, oh, let's just deflect. Um, <laughs> let's see. I would say I'm honestly, I'm really trying to be more transparent and it's more storytelling of myself because it, it sounds silly, but after three decades of doing this, I think you have to get older to learn certain things. I could be 30 years old. I could have been a great coach at 30, but until you're my age. You have to walk the turf in order to be able to coach somebody with behavioral management, you know, behavior habits. You just have to. And I would say that it's really time for me to sharpen my storytelling skills of what I have been through to get that better, closer connection, real life connection with people. Because I, I really do believe as coaches or business owners, if you're super successful, if you don't let people know your struggles or how you got there or how you what's difficult in every day, we're really missing the marker on, because we're more alike than we're not. And I need to become a better storyteller. So I would say people just need to not be worried about just saying, you know, what the hell do you eat every day? How, when's the last time you went for a walk? How are your hours of sleeping? You know, are your bills organized? The stuff that I drill them with, flip it back at me. Let's go. All righty. So since you're a fellow entrepreneur, and one of the things about entrepreneurs is that failures are actually learning lessons. So what was probably one of your greatest failures as an entrepreneur that led to your current success? Oh my gosh, that's the best question ever because I can answer that because I know the answer. My This last time starting this newest business, all things wellness that I'm doing right now has been, it's five years old. And the biggest struggle that I made, and I kind of led to it in the book with my quote there toward the end is I made a really big mistake coming out of a sour relationship with a corporation where I just was burned out on corporate America after 25 years of trying to just get leadership to listen to the widget makers and the widget makers to understand leadership is making a decision and just being that middleman. So when I came out, I thought that's it. I'm not, I don't want any employees. I don't want to work for anyone ever again. I want to do it my way or the highway. I, I made a huge mistake thinking I could do all my own social media, all my own marketing, all my own accounting. I just, and, it, and that's what I think a lot of entrepreneurs do is they forget what they really love and are passionate about. And that's your skill. I'm not, a, I'm not all these other things and I don't want to do them. But as an entrepreneur, you spend 17 hours a day doing all the stuff that you're not good at and that you don't want to do because you don't want to spend the money. But time is money. And I would just say I would have brought in the experts in their own lane way sooner than tearing myself down and my own health down and that type of stuff. Big mistake. Ah, rock solid right there. Boulder solid even indeed. Because you're so darn right. It's like, especially with a lot of folks who usually are forced into, into entrepreneurship or they jump into it face first it's like oh i'll just do it all on my own i'll be fine and then after a while it's like crap all i'm seeing is weeds am i gonna see and hope in freaking field yet right. <laughs> all right. this stuff well i think pride and ego gets in the way too right because you want to succeed and it ends up being your own your it's you and so you don't want to fail and so the last thing you want to do is most of us who do become entrepreneurs we are we you know is it a job is it a hobby or is it a business? Those are very, very different things. If you love making jewelry, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a fantastic business. Just because that it, may, it doesn't mean that it's going to be very lucrative. So if you are passionate and purposeful on what you want to do and your skill, that's where your energy needs to flow. That's where the content needs to go. That's where you need to have your spark. You can't be spending it over here hours and hours and hours learning how to build a website because 
what I found is with trying to do everything in my ego, in my pride of not wanting to let my baby go, because no one could possibly understand what, you know, I felt my mission was nobody who could understand my mission by doing all these things over here. My content suffered, my coaching suffered, my clients suffered, my relationship suffered, my health suffered. And I got to the place where I was just showing up in my own coaching practice as if it was a job. And that's not the way it started out. So that's, and I'm still working on getting special people around me. And, and I pray all the time. This is what I say every day. I say, you know, thank you for the people that I, that you put before me. You know, I, I, I appreciate everything that I have. I'm so grateful for what I have, but continue to bring in the collaborations and the people and any forces or resources for my higher good that will keep me on my path and my purpose. And that may mean people, that may mean a check drops in the mail, that may be a conversation with you, but I want the experts around me to keep me from my higher good in line. I don't want to do it all. Too tight, maybe too old though. You know, I don't know. Oh yeah, oh yeah. What are your thoughts? Were you saying you agree kind of with that same thing? Oh yeah, because actually one of our past guests comes to mind, Chris Ward, she always talks about having a win team or what is next team because one of the major things that helped her survive in her business when she lost her husband, I believe it was to, I think it was pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, one of those cancers, mm -hmm. and and she was out of her business for about a good, I'd say one to two years grieving, and her business stayed afloat because she had a good team around her, and that happened for her benefit because a few years ago before her husband started getting ill she was doing everything by herself <laughs> she even has this funny story right. where she was walking down the hallway with one eye closed resting the one eye <laughs> that she tried to rest the other eye and all this other stuff so yeah it's it's very important very important. It, it's it's so true I, you know i i get migraines a lot and that's mm -hmm. you know you can't call in sick there's no call in sick. Uh -huh. There's no one that, that steps in and, and takes care of everything that I need to take care of. And that I really didn't, I honestly didn't think that plan out when I started off doing my own gig five years ago. Um, you can't just sit three days in a bed with a migraine. So you're right. You need to have a strong team around you. But I, I think the tough part is, as an entrepreneur, and I've let some people go in the last year, I, you know, I let one go and it was, it was an ugly one of my ugliest relationships professionally, but you either align with me and understand. And I mean, I can, I, I can wax and wane and I'm a team player. Don't get me wrong, but I am 56 years going to be 56 years old. And I know what I'm on this planet to do. And I know my mission, vision, and values. And you don't have to be on my team. I want you on my team, but you don't have to be on my team. And that, as I've matured, I am more, I am proud of myself to stand up tall and be able to say, I don't have to work for everybody and I don't have to take every client. I get to choose and because they're on my resume too. I say that all the time. I don't have to work with you. I want to look forward to you too. And I want to help you too, but I don't have to because you're on my resume too. I want you to be successful. I'm not just doing this because I, I, I'm doing this because it's from my heart. So yeah, kind of sounds right. a little bit bossy. Jeez. <laughs> Don't worry, you sound freaking great. Well, here's a fun question for you. Still a fan of the Twix candy? Oh, did you do your homework? I am. What? Left side, right side. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am. I uh I space it out though. Sugar gives me migraines, but, and I have, I'm really snobby about my, my snacks and foods and I can't moderate. That's a secret. I mean, I'll tell you straight up. I cannot moderate my sugar. If I'm going to bring something into the house, I bring in one or two portions because I am no different than anybody else. If you stand there and think, oh, I'm going to bring in a big cake, I'm going to eat one slice every night. Every <laughs> no, no, you're not. You're going to have to put that in, in, in the garbage disposal with water on it, or you're going to eat the whole thing. And I'm no different than anyone else. So I don't eat a Twix bar every day, but you know, I do like, what's your favorite? What's your favorite uh, snack? What's your favorite? Is it baked goods? I love baked goods too. Well, baked goods are amazing. Like, like Twix is definitely in my top three candy. Ooh, it's... See? We are yeah. pals. What's your favorite baked good? I love carrot cake. What's your favorite? 
Uh, for me, it's probably a lemon pound cake. Definitely a lemon pound cake. Mm -hmm. There's nothing but like a good donut either. I mean, now, I now can, granted, I donuts have... are great. <laughs> Look at us coming way off of miracles. <laughs> miracles. <laughs> we are now talking about sugar. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, there's an actual transition piece. I just wanted to get that fun note out the way. And it's a funny question I've been, well, torturing is a bad word, but been throwing at guests recently, is that if the if your particular book, in this case, Ma'am to Miracles, was a particular food item, what would it be and why? Oh, my gosh. Who thinks these questions up, buddy? <laughs> if there was a particular food item, okay, I'm going to go with confetti cake. And the reason I'm going to go with that is because there's, if you look at it on one angle, it can look a certain way. It looks a certain way from the top, but when you open it up, there's all sorts of surprises in there, bright colors in there, something for everyone. Am I doing a good job? Is there a doing right answer fabulous. or a wrong answer? <laughs> there's no right Yay. or wrong answer with this one. <laughs> hey, I go for the A, Dom. I was a cheerleader too. <laughs> you say what did you say to that question oh uh, that's a darn good question because i never even thought of a food item for this one for this one i would have to call it you know what i think i'm gonna call it a whole entire buffet yeah a whole entire buffet yeah See, that's Just kind like... of the same concept I, yeah that's exactly right See, you have to be careful when you ask those questions to your guests because they'll turn them right back on you man oh, what yeah. are you using yeah it's a good job <laughs> Yeah, it's true, because books are mind food, and when it came to me, I was like, oh yeah, let me ask this question to guess to see where they're thinking, so that way it'll give listeners a reason, another reason to pick up the books. Like, oh, she described it as a confetti cake. Heck, even one guy referred to his book as a nice big batch of blueberries. Oh, blueberries are my favorite. I eat blueberries every single day. Yeah, I love that. That The compilation book, I'm going to do my own compilation book with coach it with my coaching clients and some patients and stuff and um so that they can tell their stories because I've always been a chicken soup of the soul girl for 20 years you know I believe when they did that for kids and in churches and everything I just what I love about compilation books is they're short they don't take forever to read you can sit down you're on a bus you're in a bathtub you're in bed and you relate to 25 or 30 different people and you're going to find yourself in there you're guaranteed to find yourself in there in five or six different ways, different stories. They're not going to be exact. You may not have been abused. It may not have, you know, multiple personality issues, which, you know, we have amazing story in there about that. You may not have had to, you know, fight for your child, but that's what I love about compilation books that are true stories, authentic stories with real people. You're going to connect to it. It's not just you have to sit down. I don't know about you, but I get it started in a book at the end of my day and I start it and it's like page five. Next night, it's like, <laughs> oh, page five. And I'll, I'll be reading the same book for like 10 months and get to like, you know, page five. So that I love this type. I love this type of book. That's why the Bible is good too, right? Just like <laughs> flip through a few books and call it a day. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'll freaking love this one right here indeed. So y'all definitely better keep up with all the stuff that Coach Peggy's doing because she's doing some great work with all the R's and D's. So we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive. And that is if you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but this time you're in the current year of 2021 with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Relationships, relationships, relationships. I would, at 25 years old, I would work really hard on my own and all of those around me communication skills. Everybody has a right to an opinion. Everybody can believe in whatever political candidate. Everybody can believe in any sexuality, any color, any single subject. We can still respect each other. It's all about how you approach a subject and your attitude. We can agree to disagree, but we have to learn to communicate better. And I just think that's a damn awesome answer. If I could drop my mic, I would, because that was like, I just surprised myself. That was good. Look, that's you're speechless. Cool. That's right. Because it was good I, with seriously, all the that's, Yeah, I honestly feel that way. 
we could have used that advice last year. You know, it, it's oh. it's yeah. year before. It's just like if if, yeah. if we honest honestly, if I could change, if I could go back to school and make a requirement, if that's if you, if you ask me what I could do in the world to change, to literally change the world, I would say we need to learn our love languages at a younger age. We need to learn our learning styles. Are you auditory, visual, kinesthetic? And we need to learn nutrition, how to budget and communication, period. Those five things. Until you master those things, it doesn't matter what algebra is. I don't care what A plus B plus equals C. I don't give a crap. You learn those other things and that will change lives, relationships, empty our jails out. Yes, indeed. Superstar swag right here. That's what I'm talking about. She's on fire, baby. That's oh, right. Yeah. She's on fire. Yes. That's you right. want to talk to me? I work from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. I'm on fire. <laughs> 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 That's right. She's like, hey, I'm so bad at him for making me think this late at night. <laughs> No, I'm like, who the heck interviews someone at 10 p.m. Eastern? <laughs> you think you're from India? Come on, buddy. I mean, come on. Anyway, we did it. We did it. We stayed awake. We stayed on our game. That's right. And for those who enjoy the fact you stay on your game 25-8, even though it's 24-7 and want to keep up with all that you're doing, what's the best way for folks to do so? You can, best way to do it really is to share a story with me, Peggy at allthingswellness.com. You can email me. My website is peggywilms.com. I'm on all the social media platforms, um, Coach Peggy in most places. But, and yes, my name is Wilms with two L's and an M, and I didn't leave out the I and A just for kicks. It is Wilms, not Williams. And Dom said it correctly tonight. Hey, buddy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I always got to double check with the guests before I press the record button, just in case. <laughs> always. <laughs> hey, you know, and when they say no, you just say, it's so cool. Zoom does that now. You've got to ask if somebody, you know, is giving you permission to record. So that's, I mean, if they say no, they're just not on the show, right? well no i love talking about the book i think that everybody did a great job um i am proud to be a part a part of it i know it's the third one the third compilation of you know sacred stories um but i think compilation book they're a blast it brings lots of people together and we've all gotten to know you and some of the other authors and it's, it's been a really good time. So thank you for letting me, uh, thanks for keeping me awake, buddy. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You can't call my clients in the morning because I have <laughs> nobody else who works for me. She's like, my bug's empty now. I'm tired of this. <laughs> I quit after my interview last night. I started shutting the door. <laughs> I'm going to go get Twix bars. <laughs> there you go. It'll be Twix upper sleeve. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I'll start working for Hershey or whoever makes them. No, I, appreciate, I appreciate you bringing me on and all your listeners. And, you know, you're doing a good job and you're making a difference out there. You're good at what you do. You have a perfect, I love your voice. You have such a radio voice. It's, I know everybody says that to you, but you really do. Ah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And Dave, appreciate you setting aside some slice out of your day to come on down to the Going North podcast. So any other parting words before we close up shop, Coach Peggy? No, I appreciate it. I think that everybody just try to, do do good do better do be the best you can be you know the last thing i would say is that don't put anything off till tomorrow because you already used it up yesterday because i think a lot of us tomorrow ourselves to death tomorrow i'm going to walk tomorrow i'm going to call my mom tomorrow i'm going to go do this and you already used tomorrow yesterday because that's all you've been saying so go do it stop complaining How's it going, my friend? I'm so glad you made it to the end. That shows that you are an uncommon finisher, and I am so grateful for you sharing your ears, your attention, and your time to this wonderful podcast to do something that will take yourself to the next level. And for everybody else involved in this wonderful program, share it 
with at least three people in your network so that way more folks can not only catch the fire that is on this podcast but can also be inspired to be their best advance others to advance yourself